It was the most successful POW escape of the Second World War. 106 Allied prisoners freed from a German work camp in what is now the country of Slovenia, but it was classified as a secret for decades. Now this adventure tale is finally being told in a new book, The Greatest Escape, and the author, Neil Churches, is the son of Ralph Churches, the man who put it all together with the help of a few mates and a lot of partisan fighters in Slovenia with the resistance. Neil, it's nice to meet you and good day in Melbourne, Australia. Good day, Terry. Let's talk about your dad. How did he come to be in captivity during the Second World War? He was literally in yeah. captivity for years, right? Yes, yes. Well, how it all began was basically dad um, had always been a sort of interested in European politics before the war down in South Australia. Um, um, and he decided when war broke out that it would be, you know, he was moral obligation to be part of the group that was going to go and arrest Hitler. That's how simplistic the view, the view that he had was, that he was going to join the Australian army and they're going to join the Brits and they're going to go and arrest Hitler and get rid of him. And it didn't quite work out like that. So he uh, joined the army, did training, um, and because he'd actually finished high school, he was ahead of most of the other people in his unit. So he got appointed the map maker, the map reader, the map maker, um, which is um, which he wasn't quite aware of, but is in fact the lowest rung of military intelligence. Um, and then the order came to go to Greece because Britain and its allies was going to defend Greece against any possible German invasion. Um, the Germans arrived shortly afterwards. So dad with a couple of other guys was left stranded on on a beach with a boat and they managed to row for six nights down the coast of Greece and they were going to row to Crete and they got caught by a pair of German patrol boats that had agreed to meet um, at the point they were sleeping on the beach during the day. So all of a sudden they got woken up and heard the famous words, for you the war is over. Mm. So um, he was taken to a German prisoner of war camp in Corinth for about 10 weeks, um, which was absolutely appalling conditions. Um, and so by the time he got on a train to go up to Germany, he'd lost nearly his, half his body weight. And mm. on the train up to Germany, probably about maybe 10% of the people on the train died on the six days in summer heat in, in the train. Eventually he got to Maribor, which is now in what is now called Slovenia. And um, that's where he began the process of getting well again. He's made it to 1944 in Maribor, which today yes. is the second largest city in the country of Slovenia. How did yes. he get the idea to escape? Well, look, he'd done a couple of dummy runs early um, to try to escape and he got captured really quickly. And he recognized that if he was going to escape, he wanted to get away. And can either continue the fight or just get back to Australia and, and get back to his wife, one or the other, or a bit of both, maybe. So he quickly worked out after a couple of bolts for freedom that um, that wasn't going to work unless he had a plan. So he spent a couple of years working on the plan. And the first part was learning the language. So he became, um, he actually persuaded the Germans to help him improve his, uh, his German. So he spent, uh, he learnt 20 new German words a day from the dictionary wow. and how to apply them in a sentence. So after a year of that, he spoke very good German and was elected camp leader by the other prisoners and um, began negotiation with, with the Germans. And Germans, because they're all ordinary soldiers, sergeant was the highest rank. All the officers, when you see the movie, The, Greatest, the Great Escape, they're all officers locked in a prison and they can't go anywhere. The Great Escape. This was the camp. These were the staggering odds. This is a new camp. It has been built to hold you and your men. Whereas uh, for people who are not officers, sergeants and below, you're held in a camp overnight, but then you get sent out to work every day. Mm -hmm. You get paid for the work, but... Um, you, you're out and about under guard, but out and about, and you have more chances of checking what, what things are like outside. So 
Um, Dad was part of that experience and then he managed to get the job of being camp leader, stayed in the camp and um, organised with the Red Cross parcels that were arriving for everybody, um, a very successful black market um, to make sure that all of the people in the camp were in fact very well fed. So at the time of the escape, uh, Dad's fellow, Dad and his fellow prisoners were probably the best fed people in Germany apart from the Nazi elite. He, he befriended a, a British man who was a musician. Uh, and yeah, they, yeah they, they were mates the two, for a couple of years. The yeah. two mates who planned the whole thing. That's right, yes. Yeah, Les Laws was his best mate. Um, they, they put on musicals together. While they were relatively well fed and able to put on musical shows and whatnot, there were Russian prisoners in this place who were literally being starved to death in awful conditions by the Germans. And you know, they knew yes. that the situation could turn very quickly if it didn't if they didn't get out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Dad had the experience of when he did his first two escapes, he was put in a punishment camp, and the punishment camp's job was to bury the dead Russian um, soldiers. The dead, most of them were in fact Ukrainian, but Soviet, Soviet, Soviet prisoners. Um, but all the time, Dad was trying to find out who were these freedom fighters in the hills um, that called themselves partisans, because he was reading about them in the papers. And if he figured if the Germans were actually taking them seriously and describing them as, as giving them trouble, then they were worth getting in contact with somehow. Your father started putting all of the pieces together, together yeah. with Les. And they escaped and they met the partisans. They're eating and drinking and celebrating. And what did they do? They went back for the rest of the guys. Um, he decided that um, it wasn't fair that he and uh, six other guys had got away and the other 100 were left behind. So um, he went to the partisan uh, leadership and said to them, um, would you be able to get 100 out? They came back and said, yes, but we're suspicious that your German's too good. You might be a German spy, so you're coming with us. And if there's any hint of trouble, you get it in the neck first. So um, Dad and Les went back the following morning to where the work detail would be. And luckily, the um, other prisoners had covered up for Dad and um, his mates. Uh, so the Germans didn't twig that there were people that had escaped until um, early the following morning. And the commandant had been out on a, um, a drinking night with his girlfriend and hadn't come back. So the orders were, if there's no change, if, even if prisoners are missing and there are no orders changed, take them out to work anyway. So off they go out to work. And as soon as the train that's dropped them off for work goes away, the partisans stick them up and um, they head off into the hills. And that began the 15 day adventure of, of traveling 286 kilometers from the north of Slovenia to the south, staying in the hills all the time during the day and at night, coming down from the hills, crossing a valley, and then making sure you're back up to the top of another hill by dawn the following day, staying in the woods as much as possible, with um, an awful lot of Germans, including the SS behind you and the collabor collaborationist um, um, Slovenian Home Guard units. So, well, I've, yes. I've been in this part of Slovenia by car, and it's challenging even to drive it. Uh, yeah. what these guys did, who were not in good shape to begin with. They'd been POWs for quite some time. It really was a challenge just to keep this giant group moving through a war zone. Yeah, through a war zone. And basically they're doing probably about 30 kilometers a night. So that, that 30 kilometers is also a lot of, um, is covering a lot of up and down as well. That's what they weren't fit for. And that's when their shoes um, started to give up because they would just had work boots that were good enough for, for carrying pieces of timber around and things like that, not for going for long walks. And they didn't, they weren't dressed for cold nights. Um, so there was a whole bunch of, of things going on. So there was a lot of people who were um, discontented. So Dad and Liz both reckon they probably walked the distance maybe one and a half times, maybe twice, because they kept on going up and down the line, mm -hmm. um, reassuring everybody, motivating everybody to keep going. So, And and they referred to your dad as the crow because he was the Australian <laughs> guy. It's the South Australian guy. In, in Australia, 
uh, the in, we all have insults for different parts of the country where they come from. And the insult for um, South Australians to their crow eaters because they're so poor they can't afford to have any sheep or any cattle, they only have to eat crow. So um, he was known as the crow eater, which then got shortened to the crow. So, yeah. Well, uh, our personal connection here is that one of the biggest challenges facing this group of escapees was they had to get across the mighty Sava River. And the little town that my grandparents came from is in a bend of the Sava River that's right next to the place where they had to cross. And then the local farmers helped them out by driving their cattle across the river and making a lot of noise so they could get everybody across in boats. Um, just an example of what these partisans were able to pull off, knowing that if they were at any point found by the Germans, that was it. The war was over for them. Yeah, yeah, life was over for them, not just the war, but yeah, they'd, they'd, be, they'd be gone. As them, and their families, there'd be reprisals against them and their families as well. They also on that night had a whole bunch of partisan trainees that were taken across for recruitment. Uh, the new recruits were being sent to a training camp. So in total, they took about 250 people across the river that night. Wow. In two boats, 12 at a time. So it took hours right and so they so while they were driving lots of animals across the river they also mounted uh, diversionary attacks because the german guard posts the river were a kilometer upstream and a kilometer downstream so they mounted attacks on the germans during the night um, mm. while this was going on to get everybody across the river um, and they succeeded they got all 250 people across well, I, I have no idea whether my cousin Antonia Mohar was involved with this, but we do know that she was fighting with the resistance, and unfortunately, she did lose her life about four months after the escape. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, who knows? It's even possible mm. that that one yeah. of my relatives helped your dad and his, <laughs> his uh, fellow prisoners out. But at this point, they still had a long way to go. They had to get all the way nearly to the Croatian border where there was a, an airfield. So how did that go? Well, what, what, what's interesting is that about halfway into this period, all of a sudden the partisans start pushing them really fast. All of a sudden they're going at a faster pace than they've ever gone before. Um, the hills are slightly less steep. It's still lots of forest, but it's, it's less, less, the hills are less challenging but the partisans are really pushing them and they're trying to work out why the partisans won't tell them what um, I've discovered in terms of research in this book is that there was an airfield there that um, was that the Brits ran that was supplying the partisans but the Germans and the local um, Slovenian collaborationist army had in fact uh, invaded and destroyed the airfield. And so they finally got them to safety in this town called Semic near the Croatian border. And they were met by the British intelligence officer who ran the, um, ran the airfield. And he basically said, well, look, you're safe here. Don't leave the town. Um, I've just got to build a new airfield. So that's what it took them five days to do, to build a new airfield um, outside of town. And then they went on um, a night march for two nights in a row and the weather wasn't right. And then on the third night, six DC-3 Dakotas flew in <laughs> full of supplies for the partisans. And um, then the partisans, some partisan wounded were loaded onto the first plane and then all the rest of the, uh, five of the planes flew off. One plane had engine trouble and was left behind and camouflaged the, uh, for the following day. Um, then dad got off the plane in Bari and organised um, the accommodation and the, the British authorities to know that they'd arrived. So this is Bari at the bottom of Italy, um, where a whole bunch of allied operations were based. And um, so the Brits then flew an aircraft uh, repair engineer um, to Semich the following day, parachuted him in. He fixed the plane and then the last plane with the last lot of prisoners flew out the following night. Well, I just have a couple more things before we uh, wind this up here, because yeah. now we know he made it to Italy, he sent a, a three word telegram back to his family in Australia <laughs> that he was OK, and he eventually made it back there. But just to put this in perspective for Americans who remember the movie yeah. The Great Escape, 
in that escape, most of the people were recaptured or killed. In yes. your father's escape, almost everybody made it and they didn't leave a trail of dead Germans along the way. That's they right. kill the, the, the old Austrian guards who were guarding them. Or, and they even yeah. warned the commandant who was nice to them to transfer out of there so he wouldn't get blamed for it. Yeah, that's right. Yes, Dad, Dad wanted to make sure everybody was looked after. This is just a matter of getting people away. And it, it, with, the great, with the great escape, yes, only three got back. Out of 75, they planned to get 250 out. Only 75 got out because they dug the tunnel too short. Mm -hmm. um, three actually got back. And of the 72 that were left, 50 were shot on Hitler's orders. So, yes, of yeah. 106 that escaped, um, five, uh, six went missing during uh, an ambush by the Germans where they nearly got recaptured. Um, the Germans, in fact, didn't shoot them, but sent them to different um, prisoner of war camps to split them up. But one managed to actually um, wander away and get caught by the caught mm. up by the partisans, who then delivered him to um, Semich on the night that the repaired aircraft was ready to take off. So he arrived on the last plane. So now, your dad got out. was sworn to secrecy about all this yes. for many years, and it wasn't yeah. until the 70s when uh, the Yugoslavia times were, were on, yeah. that you and your family were able to go back and meet these uh, people in Slovenia, yeah. which is now yeah. part of Yugoslavia, who had helped. And yes, that that's right. And a great experience. Well, it was, uh, well, see, dad still had to keep it secret even when he went back. As far as I was concerned, I was 14 at the time. Um, he and mum were going on long service leave and doing a European three months European holiday. So they did, went to Greece, then went to Yugoslavia and Germany and the UK. But when they're in Yugoslavia, yes, dad caught up with all of his old partisan mates, but I didn't get to know about this. It was only when a, a, an Australian guy who had um, uh, left Yugoslavia in 1947 uh, came to the front door looking for dad that I began to hear about this story a little. And then in 1984, Yugoslav Television and an Australian television company uh, made a documentary and Dad wanted to approach Dad and Dad said, no, I can't talk about it. I'm sworn to secrecy. And they said, we've actually got permission from the government for you to talk about it. So that's when I found out about it in more detail and I nagged him to write a book. So um, that was the beginning of my adventure with finding out more about this story was getting dad to write the book. Now people can go to Slovenia and even be part of a tour, a hiking tour that takes them on the route through this beautiful countryside of Slovenia. It's called the Crow's Flight because uh, um, in Slovenia, the, the trail is marked with pictures of the crow. It's known as Vranovlet, which means the Crow's Trail or the Crow's Flight. Uh, Vranov being um, Crow in Slovenian. Um, so I've, uh, the, the, name, the name of the, the trail is in English, the Crow's Flight. But um, I've, there are several different versions. The, the, the full experience of covering every part of the escape is called the Greatest Escape Tour. And that runs for 20 days, but there are other variations that, that uh, are possible. And as far as a, a movie is concerned, as I was reading the book, I could just see this coming to the screen. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts about what actor you think should play your father? Oh, my goodness me. Well, um, we, uh, there were people interested before the pandemic in making a movie out of my father's book. And um, I, they offered me a couple of people and I understood the commercial reasons for it. Um, and uh, a couple of very well-known Australian action actors were, were, were offered to me and, and I understood the commercial reasons, but um, they are tall and big and dad was small and slight. And a lot of dad's character comes from being small and being able to talk his way out of, or talk his way in or talk his way out of anything. Anybody who's small and slight and thinks they can do an Aussie accent, I'm interested in. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Neil, the, the level of detail in this book that you and your colleague came up with, for World War II hi history buffs, this is absolutely a must read. And for anyone who loves a good adventure story, 
it's it's just a thrilling ride to go on this escape and realize how many times it could have gone wrong. So uh, I just want to tell everybody that the book is available on Amazon. Uh, thank you, Neil, for writing this, for sharing this amazing story with the world and uh, sharing your time with me today. Oh, thank you so much, Terry. It's, uh, it's been an interesting ride emotionally to actually get this out of my system and to, to make sure that I'm, I'm telling this, the right story that honors dad in the best possible way now, now that it doesn't have to be a secret anymore. So, um, and thank you for the opportunity of, of uh, let me being able to talk to you and, and tell this story a bit more. Well, thank you. And thanks to everyone for watching. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Uh, we'll keep you up to date on what's happening with the tours of the crow's flight. And also just don't miss any of the upcoming stories about fun travel in Slovenia. And check out strangersintheLivingroom.com. I'll have more about Neil's story on the website as well. Thanks again for sharing your story and I'll hope to see you soon right here in Slovenia. Okay.